So we are on week two of Please Explain, where we're going over the parables in the Bible. And I'm going to start this off with a riddle. I want to see which of y'all can get this. All right, you ready? Sometimes I'm silver and sometimes I'm gold. I could be printed on paper, but I'm always a treasure to hold. What am I? Money. You get it? Sometimes I'm silver, sometimes I'm gold. You used to have silver coins and gold coins. I could be printed on paper, dollar bills, but I'm always a treasure to hold money. Good job. Everyone give him a hand. So proud of him. So proud. So, I have a question for you guys. Have you ever felt like you were treated unfairly? So I heard all the time, yes, yes, yes. All right. So I'm not going to ask for examples, but I'm going to ask you guys the questions that's on the screen behind me. What emotions did you feel when you were treated unfairly? Someone give me an answer. Taylor? All right, so it was unfair and people were being rude. I felt, hurt. felt hurt. Anyone else? Damien? Okay, so he says that he really doesn't feel anything. He kind of he kind of blacks out and doesn't think much of it. Uh, betrayed. betrayed. Okay, so let me ask you guys this. Do you guys think that's healthy to feel when you feel wronged, when you feel like you've been treated unfairly? Do you, do you feel like it's normal to feel? I heard a yes. I see an eh. I'm going to answer that for you guys. It's completely normal to feel that way. When you or someone you love, you feel like has been treated unfairly, okay? I'm kind of... Kind of messes with you guys, but I, 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 you'll see what we're getting into. So, the world can be unfair, right? How many of y'all heard your parents say that? I know I can, right? So, you all, a, a lot of times you hear that with, you know, you're not always going to get what you want, you know, things aren't always going to go your way, right? But we're going to break it down a little bit further than that because I want us to start digging deeper into things. So, the world is unfair because it categorizes people. What do I mean by that? Stereotypes. Stereotypes. People with money can walk all over people with, without money. If you're into stuff like D&D, &D and you know, people will call you a nerd. Or if you're into sports, they'll call you a jock. You know, you're preppy. Or if you're into theater, you're just weird. Right? You get categorized a lot of times by what you do, what you wear, what your personality is like. So, and, get, and com getting caught up in categories makes us compare people. And it also makes us compare ourselves to others, right? So, what happens when we start categorizing people and comparing ourselves to people is we, we tend to build some people up. And then we tend to tear people down, right? Depending on if what they do aligns with what we do, we tend to build people up, don't we? Yes, no? Yeah, right? And, and people who really aren't quite like us or maybe very different from us, our natural urge is to tear them down, right? And I'm not meaning, you know, ruin their lives. You'll be like, man, look at what she's wearing. She's wearing black and eyeliner and black lipstick. I've been talking about my daughter. <laughs> she just looks weird, right? How, how many of y'all have ever thought that in your life? And if you say no, you're lying. Just thinking like that is a form of tearing someone down. You may not be doing it straight to their face, but in your mind, you're making that person lesser than you because you're categorizing them as being weird, being different, right? And another thing that can happen when we start comparing ourselves to others is we start turning to social media. Oh, I got everyone's attention with that one. We start looking, man, this girl's got 10,000 followers and 
there's like 500 people that's liked her photos. I took a photo in that same pose and I only got like 10 likes and maybe I don't look as good as her or this dude, this dude did a trick shot from across the room and then I did one and I did it better than he did, but he still got this and that and other, you know, or these people's parents took them here for a vacation and me and my parents are just sitting at home and my, my parents stink, my life stinks, their life is so much better. We start to feel like we're lacking where other people are thriving. How, is that true? Adults, is that true? Yes. For the, what, three of us that are in here? It is, right? Comparing ourselves to others can, can often leave us feeling like life isn't fair or we're not getting what we deserve, right? I've caught myself thinking that. I'll give you guys a prime example. I compare my house to other people's houses because my family, we live in a single wide mobile home. You know, I own it, but we, we, we've got a small house and it's been around a long time, not too long because it was made the same month and year that my wife was born. So, and she's perfect in her age. So our house is perfect in our age. Don't y'all call my house old because Ms. Monica, I have something to say about it. Yeah, and we just had a marriage conference yesterday, so now we got some stuff to work on when we get home tonight. <laughs> but I get caught up in it as well, you guys. But sometimes the thing that we call unfair can be something else entirely, and that's what I want us to focus on tonight. So who's got your Bibles? All right. If you got your phone Bibles, get your phones out. If you do not have a Bible or a phone Bible, we have Bibles back there. The adult leaders will be happy to grab you one. And y'all quit coming to battle without your swords. You're not going to be able to do battle without your swords. The Bible is your sword. Huh? Who needs a Bible? So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. And we are actually going to read this, okay? We're going to read this whole thing. I'll give Miss Kim a couple of seconds to uh, grab Bibles. So we're going to be going over the parable of the landowner. How many of y'all have heard the parable of the landowner? I heard a yes. I don't see a lot of hands, but this is a good thing because we're going to learn something tonight. So while she's handing out Bibles, and if y'all need a Bible, y'all take those home. That's why they're here. If y'all need a Bible, take them home. Yeah, bring them back with you. But if you do not have a Bible at home, y'all take those with you. All right, so we're going to rock and roll. Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. This is, it's not on the screen, but in your Bibles, it's red letter. And red letter means what? Jesus is saying it. All right, here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go to the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. And again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? So these dudes have been standing there all day long, not working, but they've been looking for work, right? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. All right, so when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. So he's starting with the last group that he went and got at the 11th hour of the day, paid them first, and then paid the first group last. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received one denarius, Right? When those hired came first, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner saying, these last men worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us, have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give the last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So shall the first 
and the la- and the so the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So I want y'all to think about that. So back in those times, being holy was a competition. Even today, being holy can be a competition, right? So people wanted to prove that they were holier than their neighbors. They wanted public recognition for being holier than everyone else, right? And Jesus was very well aware of this when he told the story. And what he was trying to get them to understand is that God looks at things a little bit differently. So, the last will be first. Does this seem fair to you? Does it seem fair that the people who only work one hour got paid the same as the people who worked all day? Be honest. Does it seem fair to you? So I hear no's. Adults, what do y'all think? No? I would be kind of aggravated with that too if I was outside from 6 at night to uh, six in the morning to 6 at night and then someone who showed up at 5 in the afternoon got paid the same as I did. Right? It seems kind of unfair, right? But check this out. I want y'all to see what Jesus was saying here. Popular or influential people often succeed at the expense of those who are overlooked. I want y'all to hear that again. When you think about social media, popular people often succeed at the expense of people who are overlooked. So those who are less popular. What happens is, is you got someone that doesn't know Isabella. So you're less popular, right? You're less popular than... Who's a YouTuber y'all watch? Do y'all even watch YouTube anymore? All right, well, who's a YouTuber you watch? Huh? Okay. I'm going to say one that my daughters watch. So they watch Sniper Wolf. All right? So every time Isabella goes and watches a Sniper Wolf video, she is boosting her popularity. She's making her money. She's gaining her popularity off of some at the expense of someone who is less popular. How many of you have ever been bullied? Right? So, bullies often operate at the expense of those who hurt. Strong people often succeed at the expense of those who are weaker. That's how the world works. But what Jesus was saying in this parable is that God's vision of the world is flipped upside down, right? So we see how the workers had been there all day. What do you think that the people at the, that got there at the beginning of the day actually felt? So it just said they were grumbling, right? They were probably angry. They were probably upset. You know, man, I've been busting my butt all day, and they got paid the same as I did. You know, this is unfair. They were hurt, angry. Kind of like we get when we compare ourselves to others, right? So what did the landowner see differently? I want y'all to think about this. What he saw in the people in the 11th hour is that they were at the marketplace trying to find work to feed their families. They spent all day there looking for work, looking for a way to put food on their table and no one hired them. And when he saw that, He was generous and said, I know these people have been here looking all day trying to do what is right. So I'm going to give them a chance and I'm going to pay them the same as the people that I found this morning. Because everyone else in the marketplace overlooked them and just left them there and left their families to not eat for today. I'm going to be generous and pay them so they can feed their families. So the story isn't about money. It's about God's grace. Jesus often spoke in parables because you got to think at that time they didn't have all the scripture that we had. They had the Torah, which is the Old Testament. But back then, only scholars were allowed to study and teach people. They did not have the insight that Jesus had. So Jesus was putting it into terms that people could understand and give them a way to apply it to their lives. So he knew back then, you know, people were, the religious people were, you know, wanting to be seen higher 
than those that were considered less than holy because they weren't following all the religious laws. You know, they, they weren't not eating, you know, pigs. They weren't doing this. They weren't doing that because that's not what following God and being a Christian is about. So, if you have your Bible still, we're going to turn to Psalms 145, verse 8. And we see why God's grace is important. Because we talk about grace a lot, and we're going to get into what grace is. So, out of the, out of the NASB, it says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. It tells us a lot about God's character in this verse. God's not described as far away where you can't have a relationship with him. But he's welcoming and he's inviting us into the kingdom, not because we are more worthy or deserving than anyone else, but because God loves us, like in that parable. He didn't hire the people in the beginning because they were more deserving of the people he hired at the 11th hour. And he didn't pay them. The, and the reason that he paid them the same is because he loved that family and he wanted to show gratefulness and gave them grace the same way God does for us. In God's kingdom, it's not our actions or our status that makes us worthy. And that's something we need to understand. It's God's free gift of love and grace which is offered to everyone. Even people we don't think deserve it. In God's kingdom, everyone is invited to experience God's love. And in God's kingdom, everyone belongs. And what I mean by the people we don't think deserve it, we're in high school. I can be candid with you guys. How many of y'all think Someone who is in jail for, let's say, murdering someone. How many of y'all think they deserve God's grace? Okay, I see some hands. I see some hands that say no. Let me ask you this. If someone were to do something to hurt you, would you think they deserve God's grace? I want you to think about it hard. You raise your hand and say yes, but I want you to think about it really hard. If they did something to completely turn your life upside down for the rest of your life, that may scar you for the rest of your life, do you think they deserve God's grace? I still see some hands. I see a lot of hands that are down, so that tells me no. So a lot of us are still in a worldly mindset. We need to start looking at it a different way. So when we talk about God's grace, we're talking about God giving us a gift that we didn't earn or deserve. So I can guarantee you at one point, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, if we were to ask someone you knew if you deserve God's grace, they might have said no. Y'all think about that. Before you became Christians, and if you're not a Christian, even still now, or even now as you're a Christian, if you accidentally hurt someone, someone may say they don't deserve God's grace. But guess what? God's grace belongs to everyone for those who accept it. In the story we heard today, everyone received grace. The people who had been working all day received a paycheck that was incredibly generous for that time, right? Right? They were paid more than they deserved for their work, and that's gracious. The people that showed up late and received the same big paycheck were also given grace. Just like the first group, but to a greater degree. The first group wasn't cheated or robbed or tricked. They could have been celebrating the gift of grace that they had all received together, but they chose a different response instead. So I want to ask you guys, how many of y'all see something good happen to one of your friends and you're in a bad situation and you feel good for that friend? How many of us see something good happening to someone and be like, man, why can't that happen to me? That's a lot, right? 
This is kind of making you a gatekeeper. Who here knows what a gatekeeper is? Someone, someone who keeps things from... Close enough. Ms. Monica? Someone who says yes or no if you can be part of something. So generally, a gatekeeper is someone who guards, right? You hear about gatekeepers on the news, right? They let certain news stories in and then they let certain news stories go, kind of control what you can hear and see, right? So let's think about a gate. You know, a gate has two functions. A gate can keep things in to keep you safe. But that same gate also keeps things out to keep it from coming in to cause harm, right? So when we decide not to show grace the way that God showed us grace, we become gatekeepers. Who should be the gatekeeper? Should it be us? Before you answer, if you, what I'm asking is, who should become the gatekeeper of Who deserves God's grace? God, Jesus. Jesus is the gatekeeper. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way through the Father but through who? Me, through Him. So if we choose not to show grace in situations, in all situations, we become gatekeepers. We try to put ourselves on a pedestal and we try to make ourselves (coughs) equals to Jesus. Doesn't sound very good, does it? What we've got to do is we have to receive God's grace for ourselves. And what that means is if you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, realizing that through God's grace, he sent his son to pay penance for your sins because we've been talking about recently how we're all wicked. We all deserve God's wrath. We're all sinners. We're all broken. But God gave us the grace by sending his son. So at first, we need to receive grace for ourselves. And I want to tell you guys something. No one in this room didn't earn God's grace. You received it. It was a gift. And it was the free gift of salvation. After that, we have to celebrate God's grace for others. When God's love and grace reaches someone else, especially someone you don't think deserves it, ask God to help you celebrate that. Ask God to change your heart until it's full of joy for anyone who discovers they belong in God's kingdom. And we have to share God's grace with others. If you found belonging, if you, if you found belonging with Jesus, don't keep it to yourselves. We've got to share God's love and grace with others. So before we go to small groups, I want everyone to to close your eyes and bow your heads. I want to take a time just to sit here and reflect. I want you to think about what grace actually is. If we take God's context of grace, it's putting your life down for someone. It's putting your life down for people that will reject your generosity. 